Good morning. It is Tuesday, January 30th. We are almost finished with our first month here together. Um, we are going to, again, spend our afternoon on education spending. Um, it's possible that we'll spend a more time this week on education spending, but we're definitely going to spend this time this week on education spending. And we are joined by two members of the House Education Committee. Nice of them to come by. I believe that rest of the Education Committee is going to start watching us on YouTube at 2. And I know there are many other people tuning in from around the state eager to see us do our work well. Um, and so after last week's hearing, um, which I think was incredibly helpful, at least for me and from those of you I've talked to about it, um, it seems like one piece of the puzzle, certainly not the whole piece of the puzzle, is the transition mechanism. Um, and so want to sort of talk about that a little bit today. Um, also, the we're going to have um, Nicole Lee, who's the new data person at AOE, join us for sort of um, in previous years, Brad would sort of come in every week or two and we'd slowly get updates on warned budgets. Um, the field was incredibly responsive to this first data ask, and it seems we have almost all of the budgets. And so Nicole will come in and tell us about that. Um, we also have a request out to districts for a lot more information um, for next week. And so I'm looking forward to that. And then we'll spend the rest of the afternoon with Julia um, and ideally have some time just for a community conversation at the end um, to figure out what comes next. So, um, and then later this week, we're gonna do some more on the wealth tax um, and on the personal income tax surcharge. We're gonna have another bill on climate funding, um, flood funding, infrastructure funding. I think this will be like, the fourth bill with a slightly different mechanism in it that we'll take in and then maybe um, we'll have a chance to sort of think about how we might want to design something like that. That's going to be an ongoing project. Um, if we have time this week, we will pick up um, the flavored tobacco bill. I know we've all received a lot of email about that, um, as well as many pop-up ads. And um, I think that sort of mostly covers it for the week. Next week, we'll pick back up the telecom stuff and the um, tax sale conversation, as well as um, I think we're about to get some other bills from other committees, such as res. So if anyone has any questions about sort of all that that's in the hopper, please say something at some point. And with that, Kirby, can you just sit right in that chair and tell us about um, the actual language in 127 and what the mechanism does for transition? That's your that chair right there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Tuesday. So we've all talked a lot about this transition mechanism, but I don't, you know, I don't know how many of us have actually looked at the language since it passed. So I thought that would be a good place to start. Good afternoon, everyone. Kirby Keaton, Legislative Council. We are going to try to briefly walk through Section 7 of uh, Act 127 of 2022. To refresh memories about homestead cap change that was done there. <clears throat> so uh, my plan is to just read through it. It's um, a couple of pages, basically, um, and then kind of put it into plain language afterwards uh, for the community's benefit. So with that, I will start. Uh, so Section 7 of Act 127 of 2022 uh, changed the calculation of tax rates and, and created something called tax rate review for fiscal years 2025 and through 2029. It says, 
notwithstanding the chapter on education funding and the chapter on the education property tax and any other provision of law to the contrary, if in fiscal year 2025, when applying the funding formula created under this act, which has to do with people weights and other things, a school district's homestead property tax rate increases if, when applying, the school district's uh, homestead property tax rate increases by 5% or more over the school district's homestead property tax rate in fiscal year 2024. Oh, sorry, can you slow? Can you go back a little bit? To... <laughs> Maybe I missed it, but is there somewhere a definition of homestead property tax rate? Yes. In Julia, do you do you know the the chapter that the definition would be? I do not. Um, I can get that yeah, for you. I, I think it's it right away. It's, but it's, I'm it's really an find that. Um, sure. Where it actually says definition homestead property tax rate. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So resuming, uh, so the property tax rate in the fiscal year 2024, then the school district's homestead property tax rate shall be increased by not more than 5% over the prior fiscal year in each fiscal year for five fiscal years from fiscal year 2025 through fiscal year 2029. In fiscal years 2026 through 2029, this subsection shall only apply if the school district's property tax rate increase was limited pursuant to this subsection in the prior fiscal year. So what this is saying is if a homestead property tax rate or a homestead, a homestead property tax rate is capped at a 5% increase every year for this, for this period of years. However, in subsequent years, it is only capped if the district uh, hit the 5% cap in the previous year. And for an example, um, I understand that the average homestead property tax rate is somewhere between 1.3 and 1.4. Uh, but just to make the math easier for an example here, let's say you're in a district that has uh, a homestead tax rate of 1.0. If, if it were to increase under this up to say 1.1, it would not, it would instead increase to 1.05. And then in subsequent years, you could have a 10% or so increase and you would only be capped if you were capped in the previous year, you being the district. So this does essentially mean that it has to go up five, more than 5% in the first year for you to qualify for that. For any year. Yes. It can't go up more than five. But the last part of the sentence where it says prior physical year, there can't be a prior physical year like in 27 to 28 because 27 can't go up because 26 didn't go up because 25 didn't. Okay. Yes. So after the first year, if a district does not have a 5% increase, then for the rest of the years, it would not be able to use this. And if folks at any point want to look at the modeling that we essentially looked at when we developed this provision that is on JFO's website. So for the next subsection of section seven, in order to determine which school districts shall be subject to a tax rate review, we'll get into what that means after this, the Secretary of Education shall calculate the fiscal year 2024 per pupil education spending of each school district subject to subsection A of this section, as though the funding formula created under this act applied to fiscal year 2024. That has to be done because normally this treatment was, was would not have applied to fiscal year 2024. So agency of education has to pretend as though it applied in order to compare the years. Um, so then in fiscal year 2025, if a school district's per pupil education spending calculated using the funding formula created under this act 
increases by 10% or more over the school district's fiscal year 2024 per pupil education spending as calculated by the secretary under this subsection, then the school district shall be subject to a tax rate review. And then in fiscal years 2026 to 2029, if the school district's per pupil education has been calculated, same thing as before. If it's more than 10%, there's a tax rate review. Uh, and then upon request of the secretary, a school district shall submit its budget to a tax rate review to determine whether its increase in per pupil education spending was beyond the school district's control or for other good cause. In conducting the, I mean, I know I can. The, uh, um, the upon request of the secretary, um, is that in a addition to folks who are spending more than 10%, are those sort of clauses separate from each other? Or is that sort of subsequent to if someone is spent has more than a 10% increase in spending? Does the secretary have sort of purview over the whole kit and caboodle? In, this, in that language? In this language, it would have to be more than 10%. Okay. It would have to be that group. And then that group, it's up to the discretion of the secretary of education to ask for additional uh, budget info. That's what I thought. And then when I reread it, all of a sudden I wondered. So thank you. Could you go up just a little bit so I can see the top part of it? Here. What if you got sentence? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Do you want me to zoom in at all? No, it's good. I just missed the top part of that sentence. No, I got it. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't get what sentence at all is reading. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll go I'll go over it more in plain language after we get through. Uh so we, we can actually stop there and I'll, I'll catch us up to where we are. In plan. So first step, agency of education calculates per pupil education spending for all the capped districts for 2024 using the Act 127 formula. Step two, in 2025, if per pupil education spending increased by 10% or more, there could be tax rate review. Step three, for fiscal years 2026 to 2029, it's the same thing. There could be there could be tax rate review if it's 10% over the previous year. And then step four, tax tax, it's not really steps in this case, but tax rate review, if that happens, means that the agency of education will determine whether uh, there was an increase in spending was beyond the district's control or for good cause. Uh, good cause is not otherwise defined. But um, put that out there. Um, and then the fifth step here is uh, the agency of education is to use uh, three district business managers and three superintendents as advisors in conducting this tax rate review. So on page 15 of the bill here, the act, uh, we go through whether what tax rate review is required to consider, which is big A, the extent to which the increase in per pupil education spending is caused by declining enrollment in the school district, and big B, the extent to which the increase in per pupil education spending is caused by increases in tuition paid by the school district. And after that, uh, I'll just put this in, into plain language. Uh, the district loses its cap rate, the cap 5% rate, if the budget has excessive, excessive is another word that's not defined, good cause and excessive here. There's some, that means there's discretion for the agency. Uh, if there's excessive increases in per pupil education spending that are within the district control and are not supported by good cause. And that's section seven of Act 127. One thing I just want to sort of highlight is I think people in the, I've heard a lot of people talk about sort of people being between the 5% and the 10%. I just want to like highlight while I'm looking at it that the 5% is about tax rates and the 10% is about spending. And so it's not like a magical space between 5% and 10%. They're referencing two different bases. Uh, 
I'm sorry, the other right. That's, that's uh, all I have. Lots of questions. Um, I, not a question. I just want to say it's quite clear to me that the. I think folks are absolutely from everything I've heard following the language of this law. And what I've also seen is it's behaving very differently than we imagined it would when we passed it. Um, which happens why we get to come back every year. Yeah, I mean, to that point, I, I did just for my own edification go back and look at the GFO estimates about the number of schools that we expected to reach the cap, and it's very different than the number of schools that we are seeing. And so, just uh, it's that we do our best, and then sometimes what we think will happen is very different than what does happen. Mm -hmm. Then we adjust. Sure. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Kirby. Um, speaking of what we think will happen and what will happen, Nicole. We would love if you joined us. Thank you. Um, do you have the Zoom to sign into and all of that from Sorsha? Do not. Sure. Well, maybe I do and I don't know it. Okay. okay. I'm just going <clears> to... <throat> Okay. Um, I imagine you have something you want to share on your screen with us, or maybe you don't. Um, I don't. I don't know if I do, uh, but I might. Okay. Before you got here, you think about that. I'll say a sentence, and then we'll find our way. Um, before you got here, I mentioned that while in previous years Brad would come in and we'd sort of like slowly work our way towards. A majority of districts having reported their warring budgets. It seems that this year folks have been significantly more responsive um, about sharing their warring budgets. Um, and so you might have more complete information to share with us than usual. So I I do, uh, Nicole Lee, for the record. Okay. <laughs> so the reason that I paused on sharing something yeah. is because Brad and I sent out a very different preliminary budget request this year than we have in the past. So, and actually we sent out two, right? We sent out our traditional one, which is due mid-February, contains a little bit of excess spending threshold information that we collect just informationally. Different this year, last Monday, we sent out a, please just return to us this week, your projected budgeted expenditures or your warned budgeted expenditures and your offsetting revenue for 25. Just those two data points, we're going to collect them as fast as we can. We also said, because of people voting late, there are a few budgets that don't aren't fully defined yet. And so we said, okay, send us a percentage. You expect your ed spending to increase. And so that's why I actually don't have something to share um, because I did not know, um, typically we keep those percentages very close to the best because they're not really official yet. Um, happy to share the warned budget information. <clears throat> All of that to say, we got a really robust response. Uh, the majority of districts responded. Um, we had 106 that responded with actual numbers. Um, we know within those numbers, there are a few that are not warned yet because they vote late, but we got their numbers. Then we got a very small subset of five districts that provided us a percentage. And so that left nine districts not having responded or it's too early in the process. So what I did is took the 106 that we got out of 122, which our numbers, can't keep that number straight in my head, so our numbers include unorganized towns and boards. So that's, there are a few of those that always causes some, um, like, did you include them or exclude them? They are included here. So that is, um, I'm sorry, I said nine, but that's eight districts that didn't respond and three unorganized towns and boards. So 11. 
then we took what we got from those that responded, what their percentage increase in ed spending was and applied it to those that didn't respond to give us a better estimate. Mm -hmm. um, and so that brings the ed, uh, ED fund up 14.3% uh, compared to fiscal year 24. Okay. And that is a number, go ahead. Um, I guess what I was wondering about sharing is um, usually Brad just has some like headline numbers for us, which is just sort of like what the total spending is, what the percent of the district's reporting is, and like what, and that's on our website. Great. It's slightly different. It was like by the Great same picture just before. Cool. It wasn't here like 15 minutes ago, right? Okay, good. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry that Sorkin and I missed that little communication with each other. And would you mind sharing that from your screen? Yeah. That would be glorious. Thank Back you. To, um, and this is my first time sharing. No. So, uh, and it's Zoom, and I know you all use other mm -hmm. products. So, sorry about that. We will avert our eyes and have a silent <laughs> moment while you navigate. I'm also going to caveat, I do not have the AOE templated one, although that is what has been shared. So um, mine is just uh, a Word document, and I apologize. I'm sure it is tidier than Brett's. It's fine. And thank you for sending that. That's great. That's there. Thank you. Do I want to join with? No. You don't know why. Okay. Thank you. And you're a co-host now, so you should be able to share the green button at the bottom of the screen usually. Is that large enough for everyone? That's lovely. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so there's a couple of graphics here. Um, I've mostly spoken through the numbers at the top, the 14.3%. It's the numbers at the bottom, I think, that everyone probably wants to look at. And so I did Can I ask a question before you get to that. Mm -hmm. The 5% the five districts that have the later votes, am I remembering right that those are much smaller towns that don't tend to have like a significant they did provide information oh. um they are smaller not tiny but uh represent a pretty small chunk of the pupils okay. because one of the things brad has sort of pushed is what percentage of our pupils yeah. have responded and so if we think about the hundred and forty two thousand long-term weighted pupils 97.23 percent have responded great thank you um <clears throat> So the top is just discussing those districts that responded with numbers because that's a little bit different than the percents or the force percents. Um, and it also shows offsetting revenues. Um, so the reason that I did this is we are seeing both an increase in expenditures, but also a decrease in offsetting revenues for those that responded. <clears throat> And that's a that's something that we've hypothesized about quite a few times, and so it's nice to see that it's the hypothesis. I mean, it's not nice to see the hypothesis is true. It's sort of unfortunate the hypothesis is true, but reassuring somehow. Yes. Um, and so I oh, sorry. Um, this is what I came to present. Happy to answer any questions. Um, I can certainly, because the 106 are warned, I can share that district information at a later date. You don't date. need to go district by district. Okay. That was my hope. Very I little good be, comes of doing that. I wanted to be transparent. Um, <laughs> we get a little lost in their own districts. People call us, wonder. It's not like, it doesn't. Yeah. It's good for us to look at the full state because that's our responsibility in this room. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Nicole. Can you tell us a little bit about how many districts came in uh, utilizing the cap and and give us some information on that? Do you have that? I actually don't. Um, I can anecdotally tell you that um, right 
at the AOE, myself specifically, we're getting a lot of business manager requests about which yield to use um, because a lot of the, the reports during town meeting day have an estimated tax rate. Um, as that yield has moved more this year, I've paused on the 5% work that I might be able to do only because the yield is moving so much. Now, maybe that's not the right answer, um, <clears throat> but as the yield moves, who is above or below would change. So no one really knows. No. Yeah. Can you show us table two? Oh. Sorry, I thought they were small level line. Okay, thank no, you. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> and so it's it, the reason I didn't do offsetting revenues in table two is mm -hmm. I don't believe it would be accurate to increase or decrease the offsetting revenues for those districts that we forced a percentage to. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. This is really helpful. Yeah, representatives. Do we already talk about the the rate review and is that an appropriate time? It's about so I mean it seems like the average increase is above the 10%. And so how are we handling the rate review? And like has the, the panel been stood up and what would that look like? I can answer <clears throat> some of those questions. Um, and I just want to say that even though the statewide increase might be 14.3%, 14 14 there are going to be districts in there that are spending less than a 10% um, spending per pupil increase because in their specific case, maybe their budget did go up 14%, but their increase in pupils may have um, brought down their spending per pupil. Um, I actually made a note when Kirby was talking, I need to go back and revise the model of who's over the 10%. Um, but I have not done that with this new data. Um, the AOE has stood up um, a work group uh, for tax rate review. And when I say a work group, we have asked the field, superintendents and business managers, to volunteer their time to discuss with the AOE what if they were being reviewed or they were on the committee what's important to them and so we've come up with a list of um expense types that they think are important we've started to um develop a form and so using the uniform chart of accounts what do we want to get from the districts that need to go before tax rate review um <clears throat> but the actual committee members have not been selected yet. That that's most of the update that I have. Can you the um sorry did you even have a follow-up question? Um I mean that that's helpful to hear about the process, I guess, like um seems like some of these decisions and reviews would have to happen in a pretty timely manner in case the review decided that it was not for good cause, or um, is, do you have a sense of what that timeline would look like, and what would happen if a warrant budget is passed with a more than ten percent? And just generally, do you have any concerns about the tax rate review committee and the way we the way we structure yeah, whether this was a good? Idea. So I think the first thing I'll say is the law requires us to review based on voter approved budgets. Um, and so that, right, and, and when I think about voter approved budgets, I think after the reconsideration period, because yeah. while there are very few, it is an option to um, have that happen. And so the 31st day after town meeting day is April 5th, and that is when we are requesting that districts return their budgets to us this year. It is a very tight time frame to try and turn around the reviews um, because we know that the, the yield bill depends on those decisions, but then those decisions also depend on um, what the yield is. And so one of the main trends, and I've heard it many times at this point from both the people volunteering for 
the work group for tax rate review and just from the field in general is what what is the plan for districts that are 4.4 percent and then the yield changes and then they're 5.5 percent but they were not intending to go before the review board um that's been a just continual what are you going to do with that when are we going to know how much time are we going to have to prepare our submission <clears throat> um I believe your question was, do I have any concerns about the tax rate review? Mm -hmm. um, depending on the number of them, there is a very short window to complete them. That is a little worrisome. Um, do you think anyone's going to want to be on the tax rate review? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have like draft, like we don't have like draft power here. Um, I <laughs> also that would be rude, but. I do have some concern that people are going to be asked and say no. Um, it, it, one, it's, it, it is reviewing your peers a little, not a little bit, it is reviewing your peers and that can be awkward. Um, it, we've talked in the work group, the, the consensus is that they would like to provide a group decision to the secretary certainly not an individual decision. So the six members would say the committee has recommended. Um, so there's that. Um, but for, I think my main concern is, are, can we get them done faster? Yeah, well, they, will the review board get some hard guidance on some of these definitions of excessive and you know, the one that was in there, I suppose. Well, there are some numbers coming from the Secretary of Education saying, here's the guidelines you use in making your decisions on the review. Um, I More than what there is in staff on it. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I think, and again, being new, I could be wrong, but I think we would look to the legislature for a definition of good cause. Um, because we can certainly come up with parameters and i know that the aoe intends to be as transparent as we can about this because if we deny someone and we don't have an airtight definition of good cause that's problematic um yeah <laughs> in the same with excessive without a very explicit definition what is the what is the defense to the decision? And, and you're looking to the legislature for those decisions for those definitions. Yes, you can say yes. Yeah, yes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I well, I think I think the question is like if we decide to maintain this structure, which I again, um, I do not have anything resembling a complete photographic memory of any of the deliberations, which were thick and mighty leading up to this bill happening. Um, no, we did not, I don't think we imagined that multiple districts would be going through this tax rate review committee. I think we imagined that the um, idea of the tax rate review committee would prevent districts from going near it. Um, I think the timeline of it and the way it's set up means that it, it's not necessarily going to have the impact to lower anything necessarily. It will just be sort of a, if a district does wind up sort of on the wrong side of it, it will be more a punishment and less something that will help us in keeping the yield where we might want to keep the yield. Um, so I think there are a lot of questions that need to be revisited about it. But if we did decide to keep it in some form, yes, I think it helps to add more language to what we mean by those things. My recollection is same as yours. That Thank you. And disincentive to screw up. Yes. Keep it there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also things, you know, words like adequate or appropriate um, are very hard to define in statute and would maybe be the purview of the education committee and not the ways and means. Um, other questions for Nicole? I think when Julia comes up, we can compare what this is to what was December 1st, and that will be helpful for my brain at least. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the other data that is coming to us soon? Yes. 
Um, so the AOE is sending out a survey to business managers that is collecting information the legislature has requested on special education, uh, both costs and funding, ESSER, healthcare, FTEs, facilities, and mental and behavioral health. The survey initially went out yesterday. Um, it has been retracted. Um, there were a number of questions um, from business manager leadership and all along um, with this survey, we're working on the idea that bad data or rumor is not what we want. And so to get good data, we have to have clear questions, really specific asks. The reason for the retraction is this manager, manager leadership wanted to provide some translation or some additional context because we all are aware sometimes the answer is that's information we can't get. Um, so the revised survey is going out tomorrow morning and <clears throat> it is asking for the, the majority of it is asking for budget data, fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 25 to give us a, a basis for comparison. The um, mental and behavioral health supplement is more of a trend, what's happened in the last few years. Uh, based on that conversation yesterday, we have also added a uh, three column supplement because there was a lot of feedback that districts wanted to provide their primary cost driver if it was not already in the survey. Mm. And so we have sort of a choose your own adventure supplement, meaning they will type in the name of the cost driver, their 24 budget and their 25 budget, if it is outside of the other things that we have requested. The primary item I've gotten back that we, I'm gonna use missed, but only miss because it wasn't already there is they want to report out to you tuition information. Um, a lot of them, I shouldn't say a lot. I shouldn't generalize because we're, we're working on good data. I received feedback that tuition is a cost driver in districts and it was not on the survey. So there is sort of that. I don't know what I'm going to be able to do with that supplement, but it's going to provide um, what the districts were looking for. Yeah, thank you. I just can you say what the five things were that, that were on the survey that you already can, but just like because I'm saying I think you're referring to them again, so I'm not be sure I have. Yeah, so we have special education costs and funding. We have facilities, uh, which to clarify is capital improvements primarily. FTEs health insurance, ESSER, yes, uh, the COVID dollars. And then, or I guess the, the impact of them going away. Um, and then the remaining is mental and behavioral health. And I feel I'm looking forward to seeing that data because I think we know that spending, you know, is up significantly. We know what we heard on Thursday is that, and what we sort of may all heard before Thursday is that that spending is all necessary to each of the districts that's warning that spending. And if we're going to look at sort of long-term ways to make sure that we're meeting educational needs while holding spending at some level, um, I think we need to actually understand what that spending is instead of hypothesizing. So I'm really grateful that you're sending out that survey. I'm really grateful the districts are so responsive to it because I think we can't make policy decisions about what to do about spending until we actually know what spending is being spent on. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. A couple of comments on following your expenditure. Um, this is all 
Fascinating. But when we were putting together Act 147, I don't think these things were on our radar even a little bit, except maybe just, you know. So this is sort of, um, what did you see in the little bit here? The adventure. This is, this is a whole new adventure compared to where we were when we packed past Act 147. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is to say is um, this discussion is, this is fascinating because um, it's opening a whole new can of worms compared to where we thought we were when we passed the, the act to bill in as much as, as the chair is suggesting, I think correctly, the, the review was a um then as a um, a stop cap. But I don't think at least I didn't put in a whole lot of credence as to how much would actually happen if Kurt's budget just went reviewed or Peter's or somewhat I mean I don't know that we thought of some correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we envisioned a consequence, a specific consequence of budgets being reviewed. Other than we're going to look at them, we're going to watch what you're doing. You know, I don't think we, are people wrong? I don't think we had much. Well, it, it has that you don't get your 5% cap. It's, it's, you said it on. Okay. I, I, but yeah. Jim was asking about it seemed like there wasn't really enough of a penalty attached to the tax rate review. And Catherine pointed out that people don't get that 5% threshold anymore. Yeah, if, correct. But yes. It's a squish, very squish. Um, Representative Oden. Oh, actually, it's Representative Anthony. Oh, sorry. Right. Just, um, I'm asking myself as you listed the the uh, the bits of information that you expect to come back. So now I know X. Pick one. Now what do I do <laughs> with that piece of information? Uh, in some, I guess I could answer to say, well, that suggests that we have to find some money in a non-traditional way because this really isn't an educational cost or et cetera. But in some of those, I don't know how I would answer because they are education costs. Um, so I'm not sure that the answer to some of those leads me to a solution, so to say. Well, for me, at least when I think about, and I think <clears throat> I said this last week, um, but when I think about what we're going to need to do this year, there's what we're going to need to do about FY25. And honestly, I think that data um, will be less helpful for like tackling the immediacy of FY25. But I think in this legislative session, we're gonna need to look at FY26 and FY27. And there might be policy tools connected to that spending that we can tackle in FY26 and FY27. And a lot of them, again, is gonna be the education committee, which has now joined us via Zoom, um, if you wanna, you're welcome to stay here, but you're, awesome. you're also welcome to go back. Um, you're like you're welcome to be on the bench. I just know your other chair might be more comfortable. Um, and so I think that you know I think we're going to need to be sort of mindful of we have this year to tackle with less policy tools than we have for out years, and we're going to need to work on both this year. Um, Carol, Julia, and then I think maybe we will. Um, be done looking at this with Nicole and have um, Julia come talk to us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and what I wanted to add to what you were saying or to say also is uh, I see the the um, that um, review committee as being a structure valve. We have a law. It's a new law. Don't know exactly how it's going to work out. And rather than saying it is this and that is it and that is applied, no matter what, it is a pressure valve so that there is a way to deal with outliers or people who have extenuating circumstances. You don't know how many of those that, that might be two, that might be four, that might be six. And to have, just be able to deal with um, Pressure inside the system. Appreciate that. Thanks, Nicole. I think you had said earlier that you um, that business managers have asked you to add 
um, tuition as a cost driver. Could you say, I don't think I totally grasp what that means. Could you say more about it? So it's, it's in the supplement. And so they would have to, it, some may respond about tuition, some may put their transportation contract as the most impactful cost driver. It's an optional section. Um, I added it as a response to feedback because I'm right. I'm trying to get information. So I'm trying to make it appealing. And so. So they're saying paying out tuition. I was yes. for some reason in my mind, I was thinking intuition and I was like, that doesn't make any sense clearly. No, they, there is an impression, not an impression. There are districts that increasing tuition rates for maybe their high school, if they're, an all tuition high school, that tuition bill is going up so much. That is what's driving their increase. Now, when it comes to tax rate review, that's certainly one of the components that's already mentioned in the law. However, um, it was something that came back as feedback that they felt was important to include. One thing I want to be really careful about when we're analyzing that data is, um, extraordinary special education costs could be interpreted as tuition in some cases. And I want to make sure that as that data comes back, we're not calling extraordinary special education tuition. And I don't know if there's anything we can do about that, but I just want to sort of- Absolutely. Well, tuition is its own legal yeah. defined thing. Yes. It doesn't do extraordinary. Yeah. I just want to say it's great that you got such quick responsive data from schools. It sounds like you're being really thoughtful about what you ask and how you ask to streamline that process. And as such a volatile and complex um, topic this year, just grateful for schools that are doing their work to get us the data to be able to make informed decisions and your effort to aggregate it and share it and ask the right questions. Thank you. I appreciate your uh, having tuition in there as one of your criteria because for particularly small, uh, small school districts, you have fluctuations in their number of, you don't have a high school, have fluctuations in their numbers of uh, high school students who are paying tuition to another school that can really, really make the, make their budget go up and down. Thank you. Representative Odie. Thank you. Um, you added health insurance, or you have health insurance down, but I didn't see um, teacher compensation. Just wondered, there were was, there was some things that talked about being out of school districts control, <clears throat> some things that were pandemic related, expense increases. But I uh, just wondered about that. Within the FTE section, we ask for both a count of FTEs and the salary dollars associated. The three breakouts that we have are teachers, paraprofessionals, and administration. To get consistent data back, the AOE has supplied job classes um, from our staff survey that we consider to be each of those three categories because um, the feedback received as administration could be defined differently in every district in the state. So to try and get some consistent information, we broke out the three, we're asking for FTEs and salaries and AOE is providing the job classes to respond using. Thank you. Which is, um, um, how about, the idea still children needing to catch up academically in the aftermath of the pandemic. Um, did you have that? Can you just talk about that? I don't know that we explicitly asked that question. Um, the mental and behavioral health survey, we, in the version that went out yesterday morning, we had a question about counts of crisis beds. And the feedback we received is that's not available. Um, <clears throat> it's a very hard piece of information to come by. And so um, the piece of information we are able to come by is students awaiting alternative placements, which does not answer your question, but is, is sort of the one student count piece of information in the survey. Um, otherwise, mental health is more around 
who have you had to add to your employ or contract additionally over the last couple of years? So we don't ask for the number of students needing services. Yeah, uh, and this is not for you on the spot in the slightest, but I think let's just say a district says, well, you know, we have really, we really need to step up how we're teaching reading or math and, because kids need to catch up. That's academic. And the other things on this list are all, although influencing academics, if you don't have good mental health or behavioral, then it's hard to learn. But we don't have academics actually in here. And I wonder about that. And I, I appreciate that feedback. To be very honest, sending out a, a survey with 85 questions per district and knowing that some business managers have five or 14 districts, I'm already a little bit nervous about the amount of responses I'm going to get um, because this is a voluntary survey. I appreciate wanting to add more. I'm sort of at a point of, if we add more, get more. I, I think we're going to get, <laughs> I think we're going to get less if we add more than we already have in there. Again, I hear that. I also, just academics. Really 85? Uh, pretty close to it. Oh. <laughs> and, no. and, and, to, to sort of temper that a bit, right? We need a whole set of 24 and a whole set of 25. So if there are 30 questions for 24, you then have to answer the same 30 questions for 25 to give us something to compare against. I think though, um, and I don't wanna speak on behalf of them, but it, if I even consider putting myself in a business manager's shoes, it, it's 85, it's not 30 and 30 and, um, 25, it's a whole bunch of information. As one who receives a lot of surveys, five is about the max. <laughs> Thank you very much for sending that out and for all the districts and for all you're doing right now to help us figure out what is happening. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Julia Richter. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, we all have this amazing Ed Fund outlook on our desks Sideways. that people are really, really excited about and love you to tell us all the things you want to tell us about everything. It's the old version though. It said don't read it. And there's a nicer version inside the internet, I think. <laughs> For the record, I am Julia Richter with the Joint Fiscal Office. Yes, so there's an outlook that's now horizontal um, on the committee page under my name. Madam Chair, would you like me to pull it up on my screen as well? there. Um, so as a bit of context, I was asked to do some modeling uh, to help the committee understand what's happening in the education fund. So the updates that we're looking at here before we go into the different modeling iterations are um, in large, the, I guess the largest difference is the data that Nicole just presented with the updated budget estimates. That's now been included in the modeling. Um, we've got the frozen long-term weight ADM also included in the modeling. And we have the house BAA construct in the modeling, as well as the governor's recommended FY25 budget when applicable. Um, Can you, the governor's recommended FY25 budget pieces, I feel like we actually have not talked about those here. Can you just name the sort of tweaks that they caused? Sure. So maybe it would have been helpful. I didn't include the December 1 modeling constructs because I thought there were enough columns. Um, but really the biggest change that we see 
um, from the governor's recommended budget to the December 1 modeling is the special education line is um, about 15 million higher than what was in the December 1 modeling. And that's due to updated estimates from the Agency of Education between when we were doing the final modeling end of November and when the governor's budget uh, came out. Thank you. Sure. So, so those are the, the big um, updates. So we've got the change in, change in budgets, school budgets, we've got the House BIA, and we've got the governor's FY25 budget. That's in column D you're talking about right now. That's just the, the background. What has changed in the model since we last spoke? Um, so now diving in deeper into the modeling itself, um, there are four scenarios I've been asked to model. Um, we'll start in D and then just move to our move to our right. So I'm sorry, what just want to say one thing before we start. There, there are so many columns because none of these columns are the future yield. <laughs> none of these columns are like a recommendation from JFO about what we should do. None of them are my brilliant idea to save us all from our property tax rate. <laughs> this is a wide variety of scenarios that help us understand the situation. Okay, thank you. Yes, be totally clear about that. So, and and really big caveat. I think that the um, the 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 term that is used a lot is pushing the balloon, right? We when we shift um, and protect one property class, another property class needs to see an increase in its rates to account for the additional revenues that need to be raised. Um, and so, these are sort of different scenarios to highlight how pushing on the balloon shakes things up within the property tax space. Um, so, so what we're looking at here in column D um, is including the governor FY25 budgets and the updated spending estimates and trying to solve it so that there's a uniform change for the average bill for homestead and non-homestead. What we see in line H is that the, there's not a uniform average bill change. And that's because in this scenario, with the updated budgets, all school districts have hit the 5% cap. So the remainder needs to now be raised from, from non-homestead. So tw with the cap, 20.6% average bill increase is the maximum that we can have for homestead tax rates because then all districts tax rate equalized tax rates are capped. There's still an amount of revenue that needs to be raised. The non-homestead mm -hmm. needs to make up that remainder. So that's why we're seeing the average bill change for homestead of 20.6% and non-homestead 22.7%. Everything seems like the cap's not working the way we thought it was. <laughs> not because we thought it was. <laughs> okay. Um, something else that's just, I think is interesting is getting to this, this property yield number. In theory, we could set that property yield at $1 and everyone would still be capped. Right. So whatever we set the homestead yield at, as long as it's below 7103, all homestead district rates are going to be capped, given the current ed spending projections and estimates that we're using. I'm not going to go through the rest of the outlook, like scroll down further, unless there's specific questions, because everything else in the outlook across all modeling scenarios is the same. We're really just talking about how revenues are shifting. I'll just draw your attention to um, lines 1A and 2, because then you can see overall how much is being raised by these different property tax classes, right? Here in line H, we're looking at the average bill change. Line 1A, we're looking at how much is raised from homestead property tax. And line 2, we're looking at how much is raised from non-homestead property tax. We also 
just so we are looking at the same metrics as we go along, um, we see the average homestead property tax rate of 1.383 and on household income 2.72% and the non-homestead rate of 1.493%. And um, this average homestead property tax rate is an average, right? It's going to be different by district. Shall I move on to the next modeling scenario? Is it, Julie, is it safe to assume that in column B with that property yield way down there by 7103, that at that point, every district's been pulled into the cap? Yes, every district every is every at district's the cap. In. Okay, thank you. And that's why um, with the cap, I cannot solve for uniform bill change. Representative Taylor? Can, can you say anything about whether they hit the 10% of the other, the per people spend? So that is not data that I have access to because I'm all of my modeling is focusing on um, what, what we're projecting to happen in FY25 and what we knew happened in FY24. But that would be a question for district budgets and um, AOE. And I, I did hear that AOE doesn't have access to that. Um, <laughs> Currently, so I, I don't know. So then um, the next scenario <clears throat> to model was column E, which is what would be a uniform bill change, average bill change. Um, and the only way to get at that is to remove the 5% cap. So that's what we're seeing here in column E is removal of the 5% cap. And what would that look like? So we see that with removing the 5% cap, there's a uniform average bill increase of 20.6%. Um, we see that the non-homestead rate decreases because it doesn't need to pick up as large a share of the revenues. Um, I know that a few of you noticed this, so I will speak to it. We see that the average homestead property tax rate and um, average tax rate on income is the same. That's not an error. That's just how the modeling shakes out. Coincidence of sorts. It's a coincidence. Um, and we do see that the average bill change for homestead is quite similar, 20.6 in scenario modeling D and 20.56 in scenario modeling E. So when we think about rounding and when we think about the size of everything going into these few average numbers, um, caught my attention, caught a few people's attention and um, I think. <laughs> um, I think the, There's a broad sense, but we don't have the data on this exactly, that if we didn't have the cap, spending behavior would also be slightly different. Um, and so I guess that's just want to name that like, while this says no cap, you're not projecting the future. You're just saying what happens mechanically within the fund at the education spending that is now. So the budgets are warned with the cap, and then you're modeling it without the cap at that same spending level. Yes, thank you. I, I really appreciate that clarification. I was trying to remember to speak to that, that we're really just talking about shifting and what happens when we do away with the cap. And the same holds true when thinking back to the modeling that was presented during the deliberations of Act 127, was all of the modeling was saying, we're holding everything constant. We're only looking at the mechanics in terms of what's shifting. We're not projecting how school district budgets will or will not change with respect to different transition mechanisms. And I remember you saying that over and over and over again when we were working on the bill itself. You're like, this is all this year's spending. I'm just holding everything else. <laughs> yeah. Just to go back to like, you know, so this is all helpful for, for you. Some, right? um, some of this, myself included, Considered the five percent cap issue kind of 
only in South. For some districts where, you know, setting was going to be kind of high and they said, oh, I'm going to do whatever do. But it's been described in this room in the past several years. We said, in fact, that this turned out maybe no harm intended to be an incentive to spend up to, up to that, you know, and then, so that's where we are. I'm just reiterating what I think I heard in the last few weeks, and and it's uh, OMG now, what do we do? You know? Yeah. And this is all. Thank you. Yeah. Could I take that a little bit further? I mean, I think we heard that um, folks are making ra rational decisions, but it has maybe become an incentive to address some deferred maintenance issues, Absolutely. and that <clears throat> that unintended incentive is maybe mitigating some of the benefits that we have yeah. to see around 127, where um, folks have had more tax capacity, but now the cap is sort of shifting additional costs back to those communities mm -hmm. yeah. in, it, in ways that we did not. In a broad, broad way, not, it's all harmless. It's just as the way it's turned out from an well, individual, I, individual school district's <clears throat> perspective. It appears to have been a whole harmless in, in it. And I think and, an interesting and, piece of all of that is sure. that like making decisions about how to deal with deferred maintenance is a particularly stressful thing when I think districts have no faith that the legislature is going to act on school construction anytime soon. And so um, we are joining the House Education Committee on Thursday to hear the long awaited report from the School Construction Task Force. I think they did really good work and I'm looking forward to seeing what that is and I think tackling a piece of that will be sort of a necessary part of tackling the rest of this as we go forward. What column are we on? My column E. Are folks ready to move to column E? Or to be on column E? Okay, we're on no cap, but with spending the same as if there was a cap. Yes. Okay. So this is, all of this is assuming same spending, same amount of revenue that needs to be raised, no behavioral shifts based on any of these different modeling scenarios. Um, the only other piece that I'll just point out here is intuitive. We see that because non-homestead, um, does not need to raise as much revenue as in scenario D, there's less, less funds being raised by the non-homestead property tax and in turn more being raised by homestead. Are we ready to move on to the next? So. Okay. Oh, wait, sorry, Representative Beck. And then um, House Education, if I can't see you because our screen is shared, so Representative Conlin, please feel free to interrupt with your voice. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, but I correct me if I'm wrong, Shalini. Um, but let me just add on your last sentence. But this returns us to the system where all, all rates move together. You call me. All average bill change moves average together. Bill change yes. Together. Okay. So now, yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. so, and that's what we're seeing here that yeah. uniform. Uniform change. Uniform. To, got lots of stuff that we're trying to put on the sheet. So yeah. uniform is just saying they're all, all three classes are moving together. So that 20.56 refers right. to non homestead, homestead, and income. Okay, um, the next scenario I was asked to model was an example for what would happen if we were to maintain the average homestead rate from FY24, just to get a sense of we're really protecting the homestead property tax class, what would that look like in terms of how does that shake out? So we're maintaining the FY24 average homestead rate, which was $1.311. So we're seeing that corresponding here. Um, is it an issue that you can't see what each row refers to? So I make this it's smaller? Okay. okay. Um, so what we're seeing here is the average bill increase for homestead if we maintain the average rate from FY24 is going to be 14.3. And that makes sense because that corresponds with the average grand list growth. 
that's estimated. Um, that also means, uh, as we talked about earlier, the non-homestead property tax needs to make up for the difference in revenues. So while homestead is in, has an average bill increase of 14.3, non-homestead has an average bill increase of 27% um, in this scenario. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's the point. That's the bubble. Yeah, I think that's the point to be made. There's a balloon. This is the balloon. This is what happens when you push on the place in the balloon. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Um, submit revenue. I know I keep saying the same thing, but all else equal, the revenue needs to be made up somewhere. Um, and here we're seeing it being made up with non-homestead. Uh, the final, and, sorry, and again, the non-homestead is not second homes. It is commercial properties, it is rental properties, it is camps, it is everything that is not a homestead. Okay, sorry, just. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and if anyone's like, dear God, Chair Kornheiser, stop being such a professor, feel free to like jump in with those random tidbits each time. I'm just aware that there are a lot of people paying attention right now and I wanna make sure we have all the context. Um, I appreciate the context being added also by people other than me because I don't wanna to be too much of a broken record. Um, I will point out one other thing. And if this is, if this is too off topic, I, we don't need to go into it more detail. I do wanna point out that in all of these scenarios, the property tax credit, which we're seeing here where my cursor is, is remaining the same. Um, and that's really because and we can go on a deeper dive on this, that's because the property tax credit is on a lag. It's based on last year's income. So we won't see the corresponding property tax credit associated with FY25 until FY26 tax bills. So that's really why the property tax credit in all of these different modeling scenarios remains the same. Your committee is actively inside the Zoom now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that means that unless we change statute, which we certainly can do, folks paying on income are going to not have a credit that's um, sort of to scale with their new property tax bill, um, which is sort of a slight challenge in some years and would likely be a significant challenge in this year. But what would happen to the... <clears throat> What would happen to the bubble if we did do something about it this year? Yeah, so um, so the, the property tax credit um, that we're looking at here, this is reflecting FY24. Um, so it would show up in FY26. If you wanted it to be showing up in FY25, the way to do that would be to, one of the ways to do that that comes to mind would be to increase the property tax credit on FY25 bills. Um, provide, as, as, we've, as we keep talking, providing relief somewhere um, means that those revenues need to be raised. So if you're increasing the property tax credit that you're paying out in FY25, that increases expenditures out of the Ed Fund, essentially, which then those, those expenditures, that increased property tax credit further needs to be made up elsewhere. Um, and if we're talking about the property tax being the only flexible lever that General Assembly is working with, that means increasing homestead property tax rates and or increasing the, the non-homestead property tax rate. We're gonna have to dive deeper into that, but helps, I know. Did you find? Or you could, you could raise revenues in other ways. Yes. Yes. Um, you could raise revenues in other ways. You could decrease expenditures <laughs> elsewhere as well. That's why I, I'm trying to wave the flag of all else equal. If we're only talking about shifting the balloon within property taxes, that's what needs to happen. And certainly, there are other policy levers at your disposal. Um, Seems like a tough year for all else equal. <laughs> it does feel like a tough year for all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Was there another <clears throat> hand that I meant? Back to you, Julia. Okay. Uh, there was one other modeling scenario that I was asked to do, um, <clears throat> which is very similar to what we just looked at in F, but instead of maintaining, F is maintaining the average homestead rate of FY24, G is maintaining the FY24 non-homestead rate. This goes back to um, what we're talking about in scenario D, right? That with the capped homestead rates, we can only raise so much revenue um, on homestead property tax. So in order to maintain the FY24 non-homestead rate, we also need to eliminate the cap just for the purpose of this modeling exercise. So this is the FY24 non-homestead rate and no cap, which has the mechanics of no cap, but doesn't necessarily correspond with any um, spending changes of no cap. So what we see, pretty much the, the converse of what we saw in scenario F, that non-homestead is raising by 14.3% average bill, which corresponds with the average grand list growth and homestead um, average bill increasing by 27.8% to make up the, the revenues that, that need to be made up that aren't being raised on non-homestead. Questions there? Thoughts, inspirations. Anyone in house education have anything? Don't stop sharing. Think so? Thanks. I think we're that... okay. We've been sort of chatting some of these issues as you've been explaining them. Been helpful. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think then with. That maybe we should take a break um, and then come back and tackle some more content. <clears throat> Sound good? Sure. Okay. Um, we are still the House Ways and Means Committee. We are joined by the House Education Committee. It is some date near the end of January, but I don't remember anymore. Ah, it's the 30th. And um, we're going to finish up our day having a conversation. <laughs> um, so I would, um, I think I framed a couple times this idea of sort of short-term, long-term spectrum between short-term and long-term um, revenue options, spending options. Somewhere in the middle is like policy tools just, that just move responsibility, toggle the responsibility to some other buckets, taxpayers. Um, For short-term options, I just want to name that budgets are like basically currently being warned. Um, and so as we're like the short-term options are more urgent because of that, right? Um, I think... I have some nervousness about sort of two different scenarios that I'd love to share with you all. And then I'd love to actually, let's just start with what did people hear on Thursday that is like helpful to put on the room? Cause we did not debrief the Thursday hearing with each other. Um, I just said what I sort of heard from the Thursday hearing. So does anyone want to sort of share any reflections from Thursday? It was Thursday that we had the joint hearing, right? I'll be joint hearing. Okay. Yeah, that was Thursday. Anyone? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yes. <laughs> Emily, I, I'd be happy to start. Cool. Thanks, Peter. So I think what was uh, interesting to hear was that, first of all, a lot of the stories were different, but that, you know, we hear a lot of mention of Act 127, and specifically the weighting and how that's affecting tax rates. Yet we heard from folks who basically said, you know, we're kind of neutral, we're kind of in the middle. For us, it's all about ed spending uh, and the things that over which we don't have a lot of control, uh, including sort of the student need that continues to exist without the federal funding to, to make it happen. 
So it was educational for me to hear uh, that it's many factors. I'm not saying anything that we haven't all said before, but that so many districts, for so many districts, it was much more all the other factors than it was pupil waiting that was affecting their tax rates. Appreciate that. I was just, I think this is aligned with what Peter just said at the risk of being really basic. It seems like the unifying factor was that everyone's kind of in a similar boat, but that different districts feel the reasons they're in that boat are different and the solutions are therefore different. I was excited the districts could hear from each other. I didn't go into the hearing with anticipating that. I went into it anticipating what we would hear. And then I really appreciated that they could hear from each other um, about sort of how different the causes might be, though we are all in that same Ed Fund boat together. Yeah, for some reason. And I agree. I think it was really good that they could hear from each other. But even that said, uh, I think the cap, and I wasn't here, as you know, Emily, when this, this plan was put together. So it's difficult for me to even make a comment, but what seems obvious to me is that that cap, that 5% is not working the way it was intended. In fact, it's, it's being a negative, so we ought to ditch it. Yeah, I agree that cap is not working the way we intended it. Yeah, Scott. It, my takeaway was um, the, and I completely understand why, just the, the districts, the disconnect between you know, they got, they received their weighting change and it has been overpowered by the increase in spending and they just can't, they just don't understand how one is taking away what they thought was an advantage. And, and I don't, I understand why it's really complicated, but they, they don't, not only do they don't seem to understand it, but they seem to me like they're starting, they're putting a foot in the bucket of, they don't trust it like the whole thing yeah. i feel really nervous about that idea that like folks are the i think we spent a lot of time last year or two years ago talking about the relationship between um sort of that's educational equity simplicity and um voter decision making like local control and how hard those three things are to balance and we sort of always lose one of them. And what we lose is simplicity generally in our system. Um, and I feel scared about that sort of eroding the voter decision-making part of the puzzle right now. Yeah. Um, to your point about sort of the value of having all that testimony together, I know I heard from a constituent who was listening to the testimony and she was like, wow, I've been so immersed in our own little ups and downs and challenges with our own school budget that it like, it's staggering to kind of hear our challenges and the exponential sort of size and scale of the challenges and they all add up together, which I think, you know, is just one of the inherent tensions of the system where there are local decisions made or a yield is even said and trying to have a whole system that works together, but it's really hard at the individual level to sort of see how your piece fits into that broader piece and it creates such complexity and it gives us very limited tools at this point to address some of the system-wide challenges that are driving massive spending. I'm gonna try not calling on people and see what happens. And we'll just act like we're having a conversation. Let's try it. I, I heard. Um, a little bit of, okay, we get how the weights <clears throat> are going with equity across the board. And then we got all the spending decisions and then, okay, we can almost bear this. And then CLA is coming. And that's equity from town to town across the state. So the two, I heard more of the CLA concern um, on Thursday than the other. And I think close to what I think you were saying, which is um, when you have equity in a formula, it can feel stressful. Because it isn't as doesn't seem as straightforward. And so then then it's a it's tough. Yeah. It's tough to explain. It's tough to, to bear sometimes. I think there are two pieces of that. One, um, I think it's sort of that 
we have these two pieces that are making so many pieces that are making things confusing. Um, I, I'm nervous that we're going to have an instinct to do something with the CLA to appear politically um, responsive to people's concerns about the CLA that at the end of the day is going to be sort of mathematically the same as if we hadn't done anything. And I, I just have like very mixed feelings about behaving that way. And I just sort of want to name that for you all publicly. Um, and so like, that's, that's sort of one piece. And I think maybe we could tackle that when we're thinking about FY26 rather than FY25. Um, the other thing is, I think we haven't spent that much time, like Julia said, it's a nonlinear relationship to us um, about people waiting about the um, 5% and spending and tax rates and how the 5% creates a nonlinear relationship between spending and tax rates. And I don't think we've spent a lot of time talking about how like, it's not just nonlinear, it's actually like circular and iterative. That's correct. And how unbelievably confusing that makes it for anyone trying to make those local decisions that Catherine described um, and makes it almost impossible if we wind up in a situation where districts budgets don't pass and they need to lower their spending in order to bring their rate down. It's very possible that we have a lot of districts in the state that actually would not be able to bring their budget down far enough because of this circular nonlinear relationship to ever pass a budget, which would then default to last year's spending because that's what we have in statute which would essentially be what they're already spending this year and is in the <laughs> failed budget. Um, and so taxpayers would have taxes essentially imposed on them that they had rejected. That's my biggest concern. That's, I think that's next year to fall. That's one of my top three concerns, yes. Can you, can you run through that paragraph again that yeah. started with the what happens if they all pay? Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so I, think, um, I think there are two scenarios that I'm like top line nervous about right now. Um, one is we have a lot of budgets fail around the state because tax rates are anticipated to be really high based on the December 1st letter. And we know that actually, if we don't act, they'll be even higher than the December. I mean, if we act just in a total linear way based on this outlook without doing something else, if we just set the yield that's in the outlook, um, tax rates would be quite high. There's a high likelihood that they might fail. Um, if budgets fail, that's really like incredibly difficult for communities, especially communities that don't wrestle with it all that often. You know, the distrust that you then start to build between voters and schools and how teachers then feel, not try, like it's just a terrible emotional experience. But mathematically, because the 5% threshold isn't linear, districts could cut a huge amount from their budgets in an effort to be responsive to taxpayers and still not actually lower their tax rates very much. And so voters won't feel that those school boards and superintendents are being responsive to their rejection of a budget. And mm -hmm. if that keeps on happening, we have in statute that budgets default to last year's spending that's sort of in statute that if a budget can't pass, they default to last year. It's about last year, last year's uh, educational spending is- Last year's budget, basically. And, 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 and I mean- Which would make their tax yes. rate still- relevant. Which would make their tax rate like essentially just as high as the budget that failed and in we, most and, cases. And we might be in a scenario where a school, given the cap and all the other factors, might cut one to two million from their budget and still not move the local tax rate. Um, or even half their budget, right? Half their teachers decimate a school. And still not see relief. But they, right. Yeah. And, and I want to point out there is time between town meeting and July 1st for Revo. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I um, start back where Carol Stone started with the CLA. It's pretty clear to me, listening to it, a number of people, that a lot of folks don't understand how the CLA works at all. They don't understand that you can't have Act 60 without some sort of equalization. So we can't just pull it out and expect anything to change because it's just you know, legislative or whatever you want to call it, statutory impossibility. So um, the other set of complaints, 
comments, as we heard, had a lot to do with um, the 5% cap. And your typification of it is circular, is exactly the phrase I was looking for. I mean, that's exactly where we are. You know? So, um, so here we are, of course, you know, it's- yeah. you know, I also think there's a scenario where budgets could pass with those fairly high tax rates. They may. And what might could happen in that scenario is they pass and then we wind up actually having to set the yield, we set tax rates related to the yield higher than in the December 1st letter. Because as we saw today, spending is actually coming in higher than it was in the December 1st letter. And so then budgets pass, but why voters wind up with a tax rate that's well in excess of what they voted for. And again, like distrust, um, you know, and folks really struggling to pay their bills. This is probably just the wildest, ridiculous question. Oh, I can't wait. Ever. What if we look this, this doesn't work? I don't even want to ask it. Yeah. But what if yeah, we look at how we set yeah. the field before town meeting day? <laughs> based on what would we base it on <laughs> i don't know i'm just i just want to throw out here's what you get risk running a surplus or deficit that you <laughs> yeah. i mean we could wind up not raising enough money to cover costs yes. well i'm i'm also concerned that there are many taxpayers who are oblivious to all this they're not oh, watching us yeah. 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 and what's going to happen is they're going to get a tax bill and they're going to say what happened and they're they're, they're not going to have been paying attention all along no. they're not going to understand it and what happens then when they react to that i'm not i'm not sure especially with the lag issue that's flagged too right if i'm still here so like not only is there the potential potential for a huge increase this year but that the income sensitized payment isn't even in line with that and so the heavens been paying attention all of a sudden stick a shock and it's like lack of relief so it seems like figuring out how to maybe at least that's one narrow thing that we can work to address this year i think we can definitely address that this year um okay, yeah Peter, yeah, go ahead uh, <clears throat> i what resonated with me and puzzled me at the same time Numerous of our uh, guests uh, last Thursday said, I understand, quotes, the point behind Act 127. I agree with it. I just <laughs> don't like how it worked. And I guess I'm reflecting on an observation I made. I don't take particularly pride of ownership. Namely, when the legislature had to grapple with um, Brigham, it worried more about taxpayer equity in the sense of parity of, of effort. That's why the tax capacity enters the whole discussion, as opposed to uh, access to educational equity. And, and yet it's the educational adequacy that's in the Constitution, not tax capacity. So it's sort of an odd uh, uh, change of direction, if you will, that we got we, the legislature, got. And I think we, we ought to return to the idea of saying, you know, there's a certain uh, floor rather than the ceiling. If you're going to override local control, you might do it on the floor side, not on the ceiling side, and say, this is what you must do if you're going to run a school in the state of Vermont. And I think that's, you know, that's what the PICA study did a decade ago. I think yeah. that's what the report that 127 requested of joint fiscal that Julia shared with us last week was getting at. Um, I will name that in um, 127, we actually did put significant language around education quality standards into that bill. Right. And sort of that side of this conversation really sits much more firmly with our colleagues downstairs. Um, and figuring that piece of it out. Um, and I think you all are doing, are you all doing work on sort of tracking the education quality standards and what that's, how does that fit into all of this for you? Uh, well, first of all, figuring out how to unmute, uh, but <laughs> so 
we in, in terms of how uh, the language of 127 it is not something that we have addressed um, and and probably should take this as a reminder that we should um, educational quality standards you know are that um, the ability to enforce them review them is limited by the capacity of the agency of education uh, but I think you know, you guys are taking a, a review of 127 from the point of view of the financing. We should take another look at it from the point of view of those of those issues as well to make sure that the education quality standards portion is uh, yeah is doing what it's supposed to. Representative Brady, I think has a question or not. I, would, I guess just my observation and follow up from Thursday is that what I heard. I'm not sure if it was implicitly or explicitly on Thursday, but have heard very explicitly from almost every school leader and organization we've heard from this session is that um, our educational system lacks any leadership or vision. And, um, and we're in a really, we're at a crossroads here. And I think that was really clear on Thursday. And the lack of that vision compounded with where we are in time after a pandemic compounded with complex funding changes <laughs> um, it is bringing our system of having a statewide education fund and local uh, or the supposed local control over all the decisions into, um, into an extraordinary high level of conflict. And I think I also heard some school leaders say and have heard certainly um, over the past few weeks that there's perhaps less folks feel like they have less local control than we might say or think they do. Um, <clears throat> I think everybody feels a bit out of control about the situation. And so the thing I definitely heard implicitly, not explicitly on Thursday, was that if we are going to do anything here, um, and, and make any changes going into this budget season, including budgets that have already been warned, I, I think we have to be having a pretty big, hard, open conversation about that bigger vision and future and signaling to the field some sort of stability um, and some sort of sense of the path ahead so that we're not in this place again and again and again in the next few years. <laughs> yeah. One thing I also heard that I don't, I just want to make sure I say, and I think everyone feels is just like how hard all of those folks who spoke with us are working every day to navigate this from the very particular seat that they sit in um, and how significant the needs are in each of those places for each of those people. Um, and I'm grateful that they can like see above water enough to just even talk to us. Um, so let's see, um, I hear that we need to focus on the income adjustment for this year. I hear that we need to focus on some, um, efforts at new revenue this year. I hear, I think I hear people saying we need to change the cap for this year. Am I hearing that right? Okay. Um, I just want to acknowledge that I think that's like really a significant challenge and hardship for districts, and it's the best case scenario hardship challenge. Um, it's all a hardship and a challenge. Um, and then in that, we still want to be thinking about transition mechanisms for um, districts that saw significant changes in uh, pupils diminished size. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Some transition mechanism will still be needed. I think just maybe a more um, surgical. Yeah, um, Carolyn, Peter. Uh, is there anything that, um, that you have heard, those of you who've been on the committee for the last few years from schools that is um, burdening them down in addition to what we heard on Thursday? Anything that we can get rid of to free teachers up for time wise during the day to let them teach more and less, uh, you know, less um, swamped with paperwork, administrative stuff. I think that's a good question for the education committee. Um, 
<clears throat> I imagine that you all over there in that room with those beautiful quilts are going to be spending some time thinking about sort of FY26 and beyond spending. And I don't know if that's part of it. I don't know if you've heard what Representative Brannigan said. I don't, I didn't hear it quite clearly. I, we, they were in a second. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, asking how we can reduce costs. Well, right. and, you know, within the classroom, within you know, so we the to teachers of some of the burden the legislature has placed on schools that what, keep them from be, teaching. What would be some of the examples that you would provide that we should be discussing? Well, okay. I don't even know if they do this. I guess they don't take the hot lunch count anymore, do they? Because a lunch is all free, but whatever tasks they have to do during the day that take up time that takes them away from teaching. Because the way I see it, and you know what? I know this is true. These people are not just uh, new college graduates in on the, off the street. They are highly trained professionals that have had uh, tasks over and over again that really hone their skills to make them good when they first enter the classroom. These aren't just people who want to be with kids. These are people who know what they're doing. <laughs> and, and I believe that. And, and after the pandemic, I know there were children who fell behind. M my little ones fell behind, my grandchildren. I had a second, a second grader who couldn't read yet. And so there's got to be a way to get around that. These teachers know how to do it if we take some of their burden during the school day away. So whatever is, is um, weighting them down, keeping them from teaching, uh, let's get rid of it at least for a year and do an experiment. I guess it, to, just to respond, I'd say, um, I'm not sure specifically that what that might be. I think uh, what we have heard from the field is that the burdens that, are, that exist in schools is largely the burden of one, lack of manpower, uh, unable to hire the people needed to provide the services to students, and to the high level of need in those students. Um, I'm not sure what we can do to address either of those major issues. What we need to be looking at here is if we're talking about trying to get a, a control of costs is what are the structural changes that we need to make to um, get a handle on a $2.1 billion system uh, that would not only perhaps bend the cost curve, but also provide better services and more opportunity for students. And these are, good, these are hard decisions, they're hard questions, because in fact, some of the local control that does exist is level of services provided, um, numbers of adults in schools for kids, uh, and uh, to sort of how each system operates district by district. And, you know, I think if we're going to have a big talk about changes, one of the big philosophies we're going to have to talk about is local control and how much control comes from the state, how much control comes from the locals, because we, we operate a very expensive system. There's no doubt about that. And how we get a handle on that is, is going to also raise a lot of conflict. But in terms of lessening the burden on teachers in schools, I think that does largely come down to adults who can provide the services needed for students and the high needs of students. And I would ask the teachers in the classroom here, classroom, in the committee, say, correct me if I'm wrong. No, I don't, I don't think so at all. I think the dilemma that we're going to run into and that as if we're going to have big, hard conversations is, and, and I've been one to say it many times recently, a tremendous uh, shift of social services costs into the education fund and into schools. Um, and I think, but I think we also have to understand that and be serious about the path forward on that because um, schools are our, often are sort of community place and they are the place, you know, in the pandemic, they're the place that still delivered food in a flood. They're the place that's still open. Like they are still those 
So, so do we need to think about some of the funding differently um, and, and accept that schools are, are, are placing, are playing a larger and larger kind of social services role and sometimes in very, very thoughtful ways. We've got awesome work happening in some community schools, some um, big grant winners in our state that really I think show us sort of a positive model it doesn't answer your question, um, Representative Brannigan, other than how, how do we resource schools appropriately to deal with the children that they have? They, they, schools have to serve the kids who are in front of them, and that's what they're doing. Um, and it's all hands on deck. Well, I, you know, I had a conversation over the weekend, actually, with a um, constituent who's a teacher, and we were talking about the community schools grant. And she was like, when are we going to get that down here? Um, and I think it's really interesting, like if most of our schools are serving as community schools unofficially, what does it take to actually acknowledge that um, and really be designing our funding around it in a more explicit way? Um, but again, that's your job, not ours. Um, Isn't it both our job? Yeah, but you're going to have to lead on that one, on the design, because you don't want us like deciding what a community really school not. looks like. You, you know, the, I just would like to follow up on the community school thing, because it, it's something that we have had little discussions and debates out here. You know, it's a great program. It works. It's showing great results, but it is essentially giving schools money to provide social services that they weren't originally designed to provide. So you sort of say, well, aren't we essentially by having community schools acknowledging that schools are the folks that have to provide uh, these services because they're sort of the service of last resort. Yeah. Peter. <clears throat> yeah, Peter. Okay, thanks. Um, one of the things uh, that Julia uh, reminded me, uh, one of the variations on if you push on the balloon, et cetera, et cetera, uh, reminded me of a um, anecdotal observation, namely <clears throat> the uh, differential uh, effect of uh, the CLA rem uh, mirroring different classes of property in terms of their increase. And I'm thinking about the difference between homestead and non-homestead. I doubt that they both have increased at the same rate of value in this rush in the real estate market. And so I'm more attracted, frankly, to the version that uh, Julia presented, which said, you know, we don't, we did this by habit to have the two rates go up by the same percentage, but there's nothing that frankly, it, in, in, <laughs> that would prevent us from saying, uh, let's uh, see if the anecdotal uh, has any uh, rigor to it and figure out what it is that the homestead rate went up higher uh, in the last real estate boom compared to the non-homestead homestead, and, and sort of say, okay, well, can't we mirror that in terms of the two rates instead of just automatically knee-jerk uh, raising by the same percentage, which uh, I'm not sure satisfies anybody, frankly. <clears throat> yeah. Um, way back a while ago, before we settled on trying to move them up equally, equally. Um, there was a time when ways and means played with them back and forth to try to achieve one outcome or another. But it was without um, a particular methodology was trying to achieve an outcome. And that's what I would argue some more insight into the two classes in terms yeah, of um, how the CLA has moved, puts some rigor and 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 the guardrails around that. Or otherwise, but if we had a rationale, we'd yeah. have to come up with something different. I, mean, I think it's just really hard without the definition and non homestead right. that we've been looking for and why we passed the H 480 that, you know, we're talking about Deer no. Camps, the general store, and the second home, and, and they may all move differently. And it's hard to make generalizations because we don't have a level of specificity. And so that does, I think, unfortunately, limit some of our tools right now. Excitingly, the CLA will actually be less of, have less of an effect, even if we don't do anything with it once 480 is fully implemented because we would be appraising more regularly. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think just 
um, you were sort of summarizing some of the things that you've heard us say, and I want to make sure that on that list is, and I'm, you've said it a bunch, so I'm sure it's on that list. We're talking about some immediate actions to address challenges that we're seeing for this year, but we're also maybe really interested in a longer term conversation about how do we how do we make structural changes to, to be in better places and for that difficult conversation as well. Yeah. Well, I I definitely heard, but we still have to have a transition mechanism for the prior overweighted districts and maybe a more surgical approach. Yes. And but I want to add now that we don't know what more we might need to protect in addition to that. And because we don't have enough data to know. So I, I still would think we would want to have a pressure valve for relief for school districts where we don't know fully that there will be needs so that they could still go to the tax rate review committee. Um, Interesting. And then in, I guess I would ask you to sort of think over the next few days what the tax rate review committee would do if we were making the transition mechanism much more surgical. Um, yeah, something to the surgical list. Oh, that's interesting. Huh. It just may be things yeah. we don't know. Mm -hmm. We have no yeah. idea. Um, I will say I think we're much closer to having some solid data um, given that AOE recently freeze, froze, froze the, um, this year's pupil counts. Um, also, while I am talking, just want to, um, I made a mistake in speaking earlier. It's not 100%. If the budgets fail, it's 87%. Um, so, okay. Sorry. So if budgets I, fail, you move forward with you actually are five, it's five, actually yeah. it, let, I think it's 87, but we, we will have someone else. Everyone's nodding around the room who knows more than I do about this, and it's 87. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, team. Um, <laughs> thanks all for not jumping out and correcting me. Very polite of you. You're welcome to do it more strongly next time. 87%, and it's actually borrowing um, until something can be warned, until something can pass. So if nothing ever passes, it's unclear what would ever happen. So again, it's borrowing because you don't actually have a. Your voters have not over approved a budget, so you're borrowing towards oh, the eighty seven. Okay. Um, we can look at that with legislative council instead of me just talking off the top of my head with support from the peanut gallery next time. I'm sorry, but I you say said AOE just froze per costs. No counts. Yeah, counts. Yeah, that's what I thought you said. So the, the people counts the number of. Students who are in each weighting category. Well, or imagined. They were able to see that because why? What was that artificial freeze or what was that? It's like they finished counting and so the data set is frozen. Okay, they finished counting. Yeah, like they counted and then there was lots of like, wait, this number might be wrong from districts as people all looked at the data. Because sometimes lots of people have to look at data to have okay. accurate data. Did I, I, did I summarize that well, Nicole? Do you want to explain how you froze the counts? I'm so sorry. And you might have not been listening, which is also fine. No, no, no. I was describing the process which led to you freezing the pupil counts. Um, so the, we actually worked till the last issue was resolved um, with each of the districts and then froze them. So because it's so important, we uh, have an extremely small margin um, it's actually less than five vehicles. Otherwise, we do not freeze, um, even with the number we have at 42,000. So I don't know if I'm exactly answering the question. I think you are. And it's that you froze the data set. It's not like you froze the children, right? Oh, <laughs> not freeze the children. And some people count as 1.4 children. Yeah. Case, so. yeah. 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 Do we have an uh, idea of if we go outside the education fund, how much of an infusion it would take to reduce the tax rate by? A certain amount is that a linear thing, or is it a probably not? With the cap, it is a deeply non-linear relationship, and I think Julia talked a little bit about that last week or the week before. We could um, ask her to come sit back down and explain it again. Um, there's also a report, interestingly, that JFO just released about um, a few years ago. Um, there was a little sort of swaparoo of revenue sources between the general fund and the ed fund. Um, sales tax was attributed to the Ed Fund at that point. Um, that was before Brigham passed. 
and sort of like hot take on convert the Ed Fund did really well from that swap. And if folks want to look at that report, it's an interesting one. If you're really geeky. Ed committee, what did you want to say? Ed committee had their hand up for a second. Uh, thank you. I think you first meant to say Wayfair, not Brigham, right? Yes, I did. Thank you. I meant Wayfair. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, Representative Williams has either a question or a comment. <laughs> well, it's more of a comment, but there is a question in there. As I see it, um, we are spending a lot of money in the schools to help take care of our children. <laughs> not, that's not a bad thing. We're spending a lot of money in uh, daycare, childcare, after school, to take care of our children. That's not a bad thing. But what are we doing for and with the parents to help them be more involved? Now, maybe this is at the local level, but I think we need to own some of that responsibility to get them more involved and help them be more a part of the process so that they're not sitting at home saying, well, you took this away from us. Now what are you going to do about it? Let's bring it back and, and let's make it a united front for everyone. That's my opinion. Appreciate that. I often wonder uh, if what we're doing <clears throat> isn't more a reaction to, you know, two parents working. So therefore we need after school care. Uh, two parents working, so we need increased child care. And, and I respect that, and yes, we, and that's why it's okay to put money in these other places. But I also hear parents feel like they have lost um, the ability to be a part of the process. You know, e even if they can't um, engage in the actual activity type thing, hear them and have them be a part of the decision making or, you know, hear what they feel is, isn't working. Uh, I know they need to work. Not always in my opinion, you know, how I feel about that, but keep them involved. And I think we've lost that. I think that's the part. Thank you. Representative Austin has a yeah. question or comment. So um, I'm under the assumption that this is not just a one year uh, issue Agreed. And, and it's unsustainable you know it's just with lowering um, student population um, I'm just wondering I know we have to like probably look at this year but I'm wondering what you know what is our vision for the next 10 years you know in public education in Vermont so we can adapt to you know lowering student uh, enrollments and and not have our costs continue to increase because I think it's for the public that you know they've been looking at our student enrollment go down and nothing has changed with the spending. Right, right. I think you know that goes to um, what Representative Brady was saying earlier that short term fixes have to go hand in hand with a long term look at the right. uh, about how we do this. Right. And our role has always been to educate students academically. You know, and I know there's mental illness and things that get in the way of a kid learning, but I mean, I don't know if we need to, you know, just look at if, can we get, you know, a little bit back to what our original charge was in terms of education. I think that, um, you know, I sort of laid this out at the beginning, we have, Short, we have a short term project for this year um, and we have a longer term and medium term project. And in both cases, we need to think about revenues and we need to think about what will it take to make sure we have a efficient, effective, high quality education system um, so that, you know, we have quality schools and quality learning and resources are being used as effectively as possible. Um, and I think a lot of the time when systems, whether that's a bureaucracy or an individual school or an individual family, are under chronic stress and pressure, such as the pandemic, it's very hard to put your head above water enough to sort of restructure systems or even, you know, reestablish a filing system, um, let alone like, you know, have vision. And so I think it it's very natural that we are in the place that we are in and very logical, but it's still going to take a lot of effort to figure out what next steps look like together. 
Um, and I do think it's something that we're all going to have to do together. You know, the people at both of these tables and everyone sitting around the room and everyone at each school and district and town around the state. Um, as if we're going to make a difference on this. So um, I'm going to go back to my summarizing activity for a minute. So I hear folks thumbs up on changing the transition mechanism for this year, even acknowledging how difficult that's going to be. Um, and we're going to need a more surgical approach, possibly with a release valve attached to it of some kind. Um, we're going to need to look at the income adjustment for this year to make sure um, we're going to need to look at revenue options for this year. And we're going to need to make sure that's all packaged with um, like a close look at how education is structured going forward, how we spend on education going forward. Um, and school construction is sort of a key part of that that we're not going to lose track of and do more on this week. Other, did I sort of miss any key highlights here? Okay. Um, I think with that, I'd love to end on a high note. Does that work for everyone? Okay, that's great. Low note, whatever it is, I'm just going to end. I don't need to describe the ending. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, the committee will see you on Thursday. Thanks for working together on this.